Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Today's Business Leaders. This is a really exciting episode to me because uh, Jeremy Slate is somebody that I had on episode 44 many, many years ago, which I thought it was a couple years ago, but I uh, looked it up earlier, and it's been five years since Jeremy's been on the show. Um, but he's somebody that I just really admire because of how he approaches PR, which we're going to really dig into today, um, what he offers his clients on the podcasting front. And he's a very candid, direct, upfront guy, my kind of style. And so I'm excited to have these conversations and just have him share his experience and his knowledge with everyone. And if you have ever been pitched PR or thought about having a podcast or thought about how do I get the word out there in an authentic, powerful way, this is going to be an amazing episode for you. Um, so we're going to dive in and get started here with Jeremy in just a moment. Welcome back, Jeremy. How the hey. hell are you? Hey, man, I'm doing great. I, I appreciate you having me back. And I I couldn't believe it. Five years. That's wild. So so I, you know, glad to be back, man. Yeah. When did uh when did Command Your Brand first start? Because I feel like it I feel like it was not too you know, too uh, short before when you first were on the show, but I don't remember how long the business has been around now. So the the original genesis of this brand was in 2016, where we started a car, company called Get Featured Media. We had another partner and founder at that point in time where we just did not see eye to eye. And that split off is what became Command Your Brand, which was in like the middle of 2017. So yeah. been run, we've been running the business for, you know, 2015, 2016. But like, you know, the name changed and partner changed and everything was in 2017. Very cool. Yeah, it's been it's been awesome to see your journey, um, both, you know, together in conversations like this. And also just following what you post and what you're up to, because I think uh, you'd probably agree. We we've, we've both seen people come and go out of different businesses, you know, like they're changing their underwear, and that doesn't necessarily <laughs> doesn't necessarily breed trust. So it's always well, they're changing that. their underwear, and the underwear usually has many brown streaks in it too when they're changing it. <laughs> exactly. all, the, all the bullshit seeps out of them. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm always, my red flags go up pretty fast when somebody's like, oh, I'm starting a new thing again, is what I want to say. <laughs> but um, not that we don't all have to go through our iterations and find our No, own. it's true. But like when it's like their last business was crypto and their latest one is chat GPT, then you get a little concerned, man. <laughs> that is a big red flag. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> or And they were probably on uh, Clubhouse before crypto. So then, you know, definitely. Oh, yeah. definitely Clubhouse, the most crypto. disruptive app that no one ever wanted to use. Exactly. Everybody was telling me, like, if you're not on here, you're not going to make it. I'm like, eh, I think I'm going to make it. And I think I'm going to risk it. And I, I have an account technically, but that's about as far as I went. So, <laughs> Well, I'm still not on TikTok, dude. Like, like I, I have an account, but like, I don't I don't use it. Cause I'm like, I don't see why I needed another social media account at this point in my life. Like, come on now. It's the same thing. People tell me that about Instagram. Technically, I post there some of the time once in a while, but it's not really a channel for me. And it's like, mm -hmm. if you just command one one channel, one brand, you know, well, right, then everything yeah. else can work. So, <laughs> um, but give me give me the quick because I know it's been five years, apparently, give me the quick synopsis of kind of how you got into the business and yeah. led up to where you're at today. So I started a podcast in uh, 2015 called the Create Your Own Life Show. And uh, we're closing in on 1100 episodes now at this point. And it took off pretty quickly. We had a thousand or 10,000 listens in our first month. And a lot of people started asking for help. And that was the reason I started the, the, the company was people were asking for help. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to start this business. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Like I had kind of been somebody that had failed a lot of different things. And I was just working at a friend's marketing agency. I had taught myself how to write uh, CSS and HTML from reading blogs. So I was just, you know, building websites. I started this podcast. It took off. People started asking for help. We started get featured media which did pretty well but crashed and burned in its first nine months not because the business wasn't doing well but because my co-founder and myself didn't see eye to eye and uh it became what what's now called command your brand and we really command your brand its first three years was just a three employee um you know company and now in the last um couple of years it's really grown and uh, we're up to, to 17 staff now um in in 2023 of you know really this 
growing and, and uh, flourishing brand, just helping people become great guests and really great podcasts. Um, and, you know, really trying to talk about the truth of what PR is, because a lot of people have an idea to what it may be. Um, it's not paying for a Forbes cover. And we're really trying to help people because we think podcasts are right now the best vehicle to get PR attention. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what I want to dig into today because I've seen in all the years, but even more so in the last four or five years with clients, they come to me and say, hey, I want to do PR. And I'm like, okay, well, show me the proposal you got. Show me what's going to happen. Show me what you're investing. And I'm not a PR expert is the first thing I tell my clients. I say, I'm not a PR expert, but I've been around. So I'll take a look at it and tell you what I think. And I've seen a handful of clients, not that many, blow over six figures in wow. PR. And it's been a complete and utter disaster. And it's just a bait and switch or total bullshit. And um, I want to understand what what you're doing because, one, I see the results. I see who you, you, know, who you put out there. I, I see that, like I said, it's PR is kind of like we were talking a minute ago, crypto and chat gpt and it's i see people say oh i'm a pr person and i'm like okay tell me about your experience or what's going on so it's i mean all industries have this but sometimes i feel like pr has more of this than other industries maybe it just seems like it's so shady yeah what i i'd be curious because i again like even though i've tried to understand it i don't really understand it. it's not something i've ever dug into which is mm -hmm. I, I like to dig into everything um, but I, from the little bit I've been exposed, it's been like such a painful, nasty experience. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to be a, even look at it. Um, but I want to understand <laughs> what you think PR is because you mm -hmm. actually do it. And then what the difference is and like what people need to watch out for in that space. Well, I'll say, first of all, like, you know, um, you know, I'm not a trained PR person either. I've learned by doing it and I've, I've learned by marrying a trained PR person. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, my, my wife did traditional boots on the ground PR for a long time. And I think the major thing is, is people don't understand like what public relations is, right? Like when you look at the actual term, like a public is a type of audience and relation is how they see you or, or how you relate to them. And I think a lot of times people confuse marketing and public relations and public relations is this idea of you're getting a group of people to trust you, getting them to know who you are getting them to have an idea. And I think when you look at it, that is the most valuable sale you can have is getting somebody to have an idea. But this is what PR think. People think PR is. All right, so every marketing campaign I've ever done in my entire life has failed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay this company a thousand bucks. They're going to stick me on a fake Forbes cover. I'm going to get 50,000 leads and every single mistake I've ever made in my business career will now be fixed by this program. That's what people think PR is, but it, it's actually, it's a long-term play, man. It's not a short-term, um, it, it's what I like to say about, you know, get rich uh, network marketing. Yeah. Nobody wants network marketing to be a get rich quick scheme until they get into network marketing and they want it to be a get rich quick scheme. It's the same thing with PR. PR yeah. is a long-term strategy of getting more people to know you, more people to trust you, and more people to understand your viewpoints. That's what PR actually is. People think it's going out and buying media. That's not the case at all. Yeah. And it's, it's something we run into a lot in a sales cycle is people will say, well, you know, so tell me the list of the podcasts I can pick from. And I'm like, dude, this isn't a buffet. <laughs> what I have to do is I have to help you put together your story in such a way that it's interesting and it's relatable. And we're going to then try and get people to then want to take action on that message and talk to you about it. it it's not so simple as like, you know, I'll take the, you go, go walk into Golden Corral and you, you'll take the burgers and you'll take the steak and you'll take this and you'll take that. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, that's called paid media. And that's kind of a, you know, when you're looking at, I'm sorry if I feel like I'm jumping into a lot of different places. There's a lot, to cover, there's a lot to cover here. But um, when you look at it, there's, there's earned media and there's paid media. What I'm talking about, what we do is called earned media. And that's where we put together a campaign. We make it interesting and we earn media on your behalf. A lot of people have an idea of what paid media, that's when you look at an article where it says uh, promoted post or something like that at the top. It's the same thing in the podcast world, but a lot of times podcasters don't disclose, which once again, once the SEC gets on or the, the uh, FCC gets onto that, they could be in a lot of trouble. Yeah. So you have to understand the difference between earned media and paid media. And earned media is something that's going to, you know, 
really help your caliber, but they're stairs, right? Like you start with smaller media, you build up to kind of mid-tier media to bigger media, and that can take years. But if you really commit to that, you're kind of changing, um, like kind of changing the ecosystem rather than just trying to like jump something into it. And that's what we talk about even like when you're looking at PR and your SEO, you're building up search engine you know, listings over years. So then when people Google your name, for your first five to 10 pages, it's just you. And that's it. And that, that's what we're really doing here is we're building brand, we're building recognition, we're getting people to have an idea about us. And if you do that correctly, that changes the game, not just a kind of a quick shot in to, to hope you're going to like fix every mistake you've ever made in your entire life with one PR campaign. That's just not how it works. And the thing you have to understand as well is frankly, in my opinion, if it says, and once again, this is my opinion, this is not every PR person's opinion. If it says promoted posts on a post you've paid for, like let's say it's a Forbes article or something or, or something like that, or you've, you, you know, you, you're the latest one to jump in, jump in on the Forbes coaches council. Um, <laughs> like in my opinion, that actually hurts it. If mm -hmm. people find out you paid for that, do you get what I'm saying? Because they're yeah. like, Oh, well, why did it? It's like, it's like asking why people go to a strip club. It's like, wait, you had to pay for that. You didn't just go out and like, you know, find somebody that, you know, you were both interested in each other. It's, I think it hurts your reputation. Yeah. And you and I were talking a little bit before we, we got recording here too. I don't think people realize as well, like that's kind of the, the legal way to do it, right. Is to pay the publications. Um, and I don't agree with it. I think that paid media isn't great for your brand, but there's also kind of the, the gray um, underground world of where people pay, they'll pay a PR firm which then gives some cash to the contributor and then the contributor runs an article. Now there's blacklists that kind of run around these different publications. And if you're on one of those blacklists, simply just by running an article with you in it, that contributor can lose their account. So there's kind of a lot of stuff happening here, man. It's, it's, it's messy. I don't know kind of which, which thing you want to grab here, but I'm sure that there's a couple of things we can jam on for a couple hours here. Yeah. Are you comfortable talking about what happened when you got blacklisted? Yeah. Well, I, I didn't. So what happened was I had somebody pitch me an article. This is back in, um, I'm trying to think of maybe 2017. I was writing for HuffPost at the time. Um, that's when they had their old contributor platform, which they've since pur purged all their contributors and kind of rolled out a new platform or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I had somebody pitch me an article about somebody. I'm like, okay, that sounds interesting. You know, I'll, I'll write the article. Little did I know this person was on the blacklist and uh, that was the end of my HuffPost account. So that was how I learned about blacklists. Um, Cause I then reached out to somebody else. I knew that's a, a, an editor for another account. Like, Ooh, you wrote about that guy. I don't write about that guy. So like it's understood in these different publications, there's these like spammy, scammy online marketers that go around and try to like, you know, pay in these different places and get placements. Um, so it's, it's a messy world, man. And to me, there's no better way to do it than getting, you know, if you're going to do it yourself, great. If you're going to get an agency to, to, to do it for you, great. But if any of them tells you, I can get you this show, that show, that show, that show, run away. Yeah. Go the opposite direction. Real media is earned media. You can work towards a certain publication. You can work towards a certain public podcast. But if they're promising you that, they're lying. Yeah. I saw somebody go on the New York Times through paid, you know, a paid opportunity. And that was the best of their PR cycle, actually, because it was – legitimate that they paid for it it was part of the new york times program and they got up there um but what was what i said before it all happened and it wasn't crazy expensive it wasn't cheap but a couple thousand bucks or a few thousand bucks or whatever it was i said unfortunately it doesn't matter if you make the front page in the new york times that's one time that mm -hmm. doesn't mean anything and just like you know we all read headlines every day we all see different things and if you show up once it doesn't matter if 50 million people see you once and they don't know who you are mm -hmm. the the odds of it actually producing anything are pretty low and i interestingly i shared that with with the client you know, three or four years ago when when they did that and then about a year and a half ago i met a guy who himself has pitched and gotten little stories about the real estate that he sells in downtown in, in new york city multiple times like six or eight times and he's been on the front page of the real estate section like back when they had a physical paper and he's been you know been on the main main pages of new york times and while it gave him great seo and ultimately led to business 
he he was front and center and besides his family calling him and say great job nobody cared and it yes. was like it was the reminder like you're saying this is a long game it's not even if somebody could legitimately in the way that you would recommend get you on a top publication tomorrow that's probably not going to change anything because that's well, not, and, how, not how it works <laughs> well and also it's kind of understanding like i think a lot of people think pr is a top of funnel thing mm-hmm. and it can be right like it can be but yeah. at the same time PR is something that like you can charge more because there's more perceived value for your brand. Like that's yeah. a big deal, right? Like, you know, like you have the right kind of credibility, but also like it's actually a, for most people, it's a middle of funnel thing. PR mm-hmm. is, is something that you can, you know, show your email list. You can show different parts of your community to help people that have maybe, you know, said like, Hey, I've been following Gabe for years, but I haven't made a decision for him yet. Oh, here's the right kind of media piece. Okay. I'm ready to pay him. It's yeah. actually more of a middle of funnel thing than the top of funnel thing. Like it helps people to create trust and say like, okay, this guy is legit and I should follow him. But it's actually usually something that's more of a middle of funnel thing. And in, in my opinion, like it can be used through your entire funnel, but I think it's most yeah. valuable in the middle of your funnel. Yeah. And I've probably asked the wrong questions when clients have asked me to get involved in the conversation with their PR firm when it's going sideways or even the beginning and they still do it against my recommendation. But I asked this question. I'm sure you get asked this question. What, like, if I was going to invest in PR, especially before we had this conversation, I want to say, okay, like, where's the money? Like, why, why would I, every dollar I put out there as a business owner should come back and give me some return. Right. So when you get that question, how do you tell people, like, is it supplemental to the rest of the sales and the marketing cycle? Is it, you know, you just kind of touched on that a little bit, but I want to go deeper. Like I, I, I totally understand the credibility in the middle of funnel and it can build trust and things like that. But if somebody asks you, am I going to get a return on investment with PR the way you guys do it? What do you tell them? Well, so I would say, first of all, um, this is not like a lead generation game. That's, that's the big thing you have to really get people to understand. Okay. And I would say every client's goals are different, right? You know, some yeah. clients come to us because they're launching a book or other clients come to us because they're looking to get investors or looking to, um, you know, become more of that authority in their space. I say, first of all, we have to get clear on like what your goal is. Yeah. And I think one of the big things we do, Gabe, is we actually turn a lot of people away mm-hmm. because a lot of people come to us when they're kind of too early in their journey and they're probably a coach, which ooh, <laughs> don't do that. Um, so like you're the latest person trying to package up and sell dog shit to someone. Okay, great. Let's promote you. Um, no, but we turn a lot of people away Because like, I want to make sure like you have a marketing program that's working. You have different parts of your business that's working because I want to take what you're doing and make it stronger so that it's more effective. So that's what I look at it as is how can we help you to, you know, close more sales that you're already making? How can we help you to create more partnerships that you're, that you don't want to have? Because that's one of the biggest thing our clients get actually is partnerships with the right person. Because a lot of times they're, getting in communication with a podcaster that they're in the same niche because first of all, you should be going very niche. Like you mentioned New York times, that's way too broad for most people. Yeah. You should be going really niche where you can actually find partnerships in these areas. So that's where I see the real value is taking a process that's already working and making it stronger so that you're getting a better ROI off that process. And frankly, you know, you're not going to be able to make a decision if it was good, a good idea to work with us for six months. Yeah. Because all this stuff needs to get going and kind of get going in a way so you can kind of monitor your stats. A lot of business owners aren't monitoring their statistics either. We monitor our statistics in our own company on a weekly basis. Yeah. And, you know, you should be checking what is your total social reach? You know, how does that relate to your gross income? You know, how does that relate to your total emails out and things like that? But that's what I would say is we strengthen things that are already working well. And people that really understand PR look at it as an opportunity to create partnerships in different areas. They can create kind of, it's more of a business development play, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does. That's helpful. Yeah. I think that that's probably the biggest thing that I've not heard other, you know, ineffective PR firms say is like, this is not lead gen. They, they actually well, they'll lie to you. They'll tell yeah. you what, what they think you need to hear to pay them. Yeah. And I think like even the traditional PR world, as I said, that's where my wife comes from the traditional PR world. Like, I also don't like how they do things like your retainer could be 2,500, 5,000, 20,000, whatever it is a month. And you may or may not get something. Um, You know, a lot of times when people pay, when people pay us for a campaign, we're saying, 
you know, this is kind of the minimum metrics we're going to be looking at for podcasts. This is the number of podcasts we're going to produce for you. And this is the time period we're going to do it for you over. Like, I think everything kind of needs to be on the table for agreement, man. Yeah, that's exactly what I have never seen with other firms is like, (laughs) here is the specific deliverables. That's even when I started to realize or going through this with some folks is like, well, clearly this isn't Legion. I didn't necessarily think it was, but like some people told me it wasn't like, well, it wasn't, it didn't work out. But like, what specifically am I buying? Like, (laughs) and, and I like that you have that clearly laid out because it it makes a lot more sense that it is kind of like an upgrade to everything else you're doing. And I, I agree. All my greatest partnerships have come off my podcast. I have, I've, I've, I actually have put together a course a couple of years ago because I sat down one day and added up all the revenue and like, we're well over a half million dollars from this show. And I've only done a hundred and almost 150 episodes. It's not like I'm crazy aggressive with it and yeah. over, over a few years. And it's, it's created the best partnerships, the best relationships and which has led to tons of revenue. Um, well, and, And as well, like, I think the thing that's really important to understand there is like those partnerships are value, but also like the true value in getting your right public to have an idea. Because I can tell you right now, like there's five podcasts that everybody wants to be on when they come to me and they're not a right fit for anybody that comes to me. Does that make sense? They're like, I want to be on Joe Rogan. I want to be on Tim Ferriss. Not to be rude. Those people don't want to talk to you. Yeah. Um, (laughs) You know, they get like millions of pitches, like the real value is being within a niche where you become more authoritative within that niche Mm -hmm. and you get the right people to have the right idea about you. That's where the value is. But, but everybody wants like, it's a vanity metric. You know what I mean? Like you have to ask yourself, is this about vanity or is this about impact? And when when you, when you kind of truly look at, I just want to be the guy driving the really big car. That's the problem. (laughs) That, that, that's the problem. Yeah, that's for sure. And so you, what you shared, you know, sounds like a completely realistic and reasonable timeline of it's going to take six months to see results and do all this work. How long do your best clients actually stay with you? Does it become an ongoing mix of the strategy or like what what's the progression that you've seen when somebody says, oh, this is really working and I, this is a part of my long term plan? Like, what does that look like over the life of a, a client partnership with you? Well, and here's the hard part about it, because this is the thing that you know, no matter how we try our best, like in, in, a, in a sales process, you're not always going to get it. Um, so much of like a good client program is the client. Yeah. Does that, does that make sense? Like if somebody kind of shows up and they're a jerk, they're not going to do very well from their program because number one, like they have to be in communication with people. Like yeah. you, you can't win if you're a jerk. Yeah. Like we find that our best clients are people that are just so willing to share and educate um, like we have a client um, we've been working with for, I think, three years now, and he's a doctor. And when he first came to us, he did a six month package and he did it on a payment plan because he just want to make it work. Mm-hmm. And he just showed up so willing to educate, so willing to teach, so willing to like just do whatever he could do to help people that he actually had podcasters like inviting him back on like two <laughs> and three times. So he got like, I think, 36 shows out of his 12 show campaign. But <laughs> he created those other 24. I didn't do that. Like he's really yeah. good. So then he bought an additional six months because that's what he could afford at the time. And then after that, he bought another year. And after that, he bought another year. So it was just kind of like the the most important thing is actually the biggest thing I can't control. And that's why we really try to find that in the sales process. Like what type of a person are you? Yeah. Because the wrong person is not going to go well. So yeah. like, you know, that's somebody that like, you know, he really had to kind of stretch. And because of the person he is, I can put him on the right shows and he does a great job. Whereas there's another client that was on actually very similar shows to him. And the guy was kind of a jerk. And he's like, this is the worst program I've ever done. And he got a half refund because like, we just wanted him to go away. So like, you have to kind of look at that situation. Then we have other clients that have been with us three, four years. Um, But it also depends on like, what are they doing this for? And a lot of times if it's launching a product or something like that, then you're probably going to do one campaign with them. And that's the end of it. But we have our, our handful of kind of ongoing awareness clients, which in my opinion are the best clients to have. Mm -hmm. Um, because they stick with the program, they show up to be the most valuable person they can possibly be. And they win with the program. I I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but that's, that's kind of how it is. Like it's so dependent on the type of person you are. So we just try to do a better job in determining if they're that right person in the sales process. 
No, it, it makes perfect sense. Actually, I was talking to a, a client of mine this week and like m- one of our biggest clients and his total focus is how do I make a positive impact and how do I help more people? And so it's super easy to work with them. Like, I mean, it's like everything's possible when you come at it from that frame. And I think that you're really wise to, you know, obviously have a, a filtering process in your sales process, because when we start out, you know, at least I did, it's easy to say like, oh yeah, you have money. I'll work with you. And then that I've been there, man. <laughs> Those and people the, generally don't like you in the end, though. Like, you gonna, you know what yeah, I mean? Exactly. My Some of the people that threw the most money around in the beginning ended up being horrifically bad clients. And it's working with the right people is so much more important than working with the right amount of money. Because <laughs> well, that's, that's the, that's the thing is like we we actually close way less leads now, um, you know, eight years into this than we did in the beginning because we're so selective because it has to work for both of us. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if you're not the right fit, I could put you on the best podcast ever. But if you're a jerk, it's not going to go well for either of us because that podcast isn't going to want to take any of my clients anymore either. Yeah. What do you, I'd like to dig into that a little more because I think that's something that early in anybody's entrepreneurial journey, we don't know what we don't know. And like I said, it's yeah. easy to think, oh, they have money, so I should work with them. But what are, what are some more of the specifics that you've been able to like clarify or say these are the things that the sales team watches for and I, I, i'm assuming you did sales in the beginning obviously but like what what are the things that you were able to define that helped you create those markers or those indicators of saying this, this person seems like they'll fit and obviously trying six months together is good because then you're not married to them for three or four years or something yeah. to be that way but what what things have you have you specifically pinpointed beyond because obviously it's intuitive in the beginning i would assume but how have you created a process out of that well, I guess the biggest one is like knowing our purpose as a company. Mm-hmm. And we want to help people that have that generally have like a really big button to help other people. Mm-hmm. So like we I, we had a guy not long ago that was like, I don't think anything that anyone does helps anyone. I'm like, oh, you are not a good fit for us. So like, I know that's a simple thing, but yeah. people have to know that there is help and that help is possible. So yeah. if they don't, that's one way we're going to weed them out right in the beginning. Another thing we look for um, and we have specific questions we ask people to find this out. Like, it's if there's somebody that nothing ever works for. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like the character Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. Like, if they're Eeyore and nothing works for them, like, I don't want them. You know what I mean? That's, that's another big thing. Um, yeah. we, we also take a look at, um, in terms of, like, what they're, are they looking at long-term goals or short-term goals? Because, obviously, everybody has both. But you want to take a look um, at like what their long term and short term goals are. And if they aren't in alignment, like I'm not going to sell somebody something that they think is something else. That's another thing. We also ask people um, specific questions about like their their social media following and engagement, because that's important. Like how many people do we have out there with fake social media followings? We also ask them questions about their revenue, um, because if they don't have enough revenue, like and they're trying to pay other people and I'm actually taking food off their table to work with me. That's not a good thing. So like, there's a lot of these basic things that we're looking at. And then it's also just like, how did the conversation go? Because Mm -hmm. you can find that there's people that don't want to give you the time of day. And you know, those can be really, you know, what's the price, what's the price, what's the price, not like learning about the program, how the program is a fit for them, things like that. So that's really another big thing as well. And also like, I know this is a simple thing, man, but like, do you leave a conversation, do you leave that conversation feeling worse than when you went into it? Probably don't want to work with that person. So that that's a lot of stuff that we've, you know, and it's also a case by case basis, but those are a lot of the big things that we're looking at in a sales process to determine if this person is going to be a good fit for us because we have to be able to execute the program and we have to have everybody right. on the same page. Like it's so important. Yeah. And I love what you shared there about like, if, if nothing ever goes right for them, then why would you be any different? That's a great indicator. Get them to share a little bit of the history. We, we always watch for that too, actually. So I'm glad to yeah. hear that because it's, it's like if every agency they ever worked with or every web developer or whatever project we're doing with them is like the worst ever and like they can't, you know, then I'm like, well, we're not going to be any different because there's only one constant factor in your life is what one of my coaches says to me. It's me. And it's you. So, <laughs> well, we, so. we, we, we had a person once that was tell, that telling my salesperson that they were just waiting to get a refund for another agency and then they pay us. And I'd be like, they're not eligible for services here. Um, okay. if, if, they're, if they're giving some somebody else's refund money to me, I don't want them, man, because it's going to be my refund money they're giving to somebody else later on. Yeah, no kidding. Talk about lack of value creation. <laughs> yeah. No, those are, uh, that's that's super helpful. And I, I think you're right. It's better better to look at like 
PR as the way you explained this so much better. Like this is the idea that you want people to have about you. And that well, that's so off. valuable. Like if you can change yeah. someone's mind, you know, you can't quantify that. Like, you know, you that that's, yeah. but you've changed their mind and their perception. They're going to talk to other people differently about you. They're going to look at you differently. They're going to, so like that to me is the, the biggest sale they can have is you can change a mind. Yeah. As I think back about all the podcasts I've listened to over the years, those are the people that I end up following, buying from, recommending, reading their books. Everything is like they just were really able to share, you know, original ideas or inspiration or their story really connected with me. And and yeah, and like I've had lifetime followers, you know, I mean, I'll, there's people that I'll, I will definitely follow for as long as they're doing anything. And so, yeah, that's that makes a ton of sense. <laughs> anything else you think that... Um, that we haven't really dug into around this that you think would be helpful as, as people are thinking about how to do PR and specifically around doing PR with, with podcasts. I know we've touched a lot here already. I, I would frankly take a look at like, what have you already done yourself for your brand? Because I think as well, a lot of people are looking to hire an agency when they're not ready yet. You know, like mm -hmm. they haven't went out and like gotten any placements or done anything like that. Like to me, you should have all the basics in on your end so that you can actually make it easier for someone to help you. So that means like, are you doing uh, help a reporter out, uh, Haro? Like, have you signed up for that? Are you checking that out? Um, have you written blog posts in your niche? Um, have you used local media? Like a lot of times people forget about local newspapers and stuff like that. So like to me, I would, if you don't have any of those things, you shouldn't be looking to hire an agency yet. And if agency is trying to take your money, then they're not properly aligned with the right values. So I would take a look at like kind of what you have you know, for yourself and what you can get for yourself and what you can establish before you hire an agency. Because I think yeah. if you haven't done those things and, you know, they really want your money, I would go the opposite direction. Yeah. And what I don't think people realize too is like, I've done a little bit of PR for myself in the company over the years. And it's not, it's not that difficult to do a legitimate, great guest post on a big site. You know, mm -hmm. it's not that hard to get people to pick you up. I've been interviewed on NPR because I was involved in this massive face or uh, LinkedIn group for a while. I've done stuff on, you know, founder magazine and I've done all these different things. And it's really just reached out and say like, Hey, I, I've actually spent a bunch of years doing that, or I can contribute or like I can talk intelligently about mm -hmm. this and help, help the community out. And then there's always people that will talk to you if you actually have something valuable to say. <laughs> yeah. And then if you work with an agency that, you know, can write creatively, can good, put together a good pitch, like those assets can help them get more things. Yeah. But if you come to them without assets, um, you may not be happy with what they're able to get you out of the gate um, or like you may never kind of get to where you're going. So it really does help you in the beginning to have some of those assets before you kind of bring on an agency. Yeah, definitely. Well, as we kind of move to wrapping up here in a little bit, you have a book that came out recently, right? You want to tell us yeah, about that? Yeah, that's been an odyssey, man, because you know the backside of this since you and I were talking about it a year ago. Um, we, we, we launched this book. We were so excited. And then our publisher was like, so we went out of business yesterday. I'm like, wait, what? Is that why nobody could get the book today? Um, so then we had this whole thing of like trying to basically figure out what the heck to do. Um, and we actually ended up working with Morgan James Publishing after that, which has been really great. Um, it's been really good positioning for the book. And um, it, it is back out. But in order to, uh, you know, get the book extraordinary out there. I had to become a little bit more extraordinary and creative myself to figure out like what the heck to do. Um, and, um, you know, we're just kind of really excited to get it out there, but dude, like, I think, you know, more than most because I kind of came to you right away and I was like, what the hell just happened? Um, Same thing it, happened it, to me. That's why. It's <laughs> been an odyssey, man. Um, I, I, I feel like Odysseus coming back to coming back on my raft. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, talk about talk about an industry that uh, has some similar challenges over there as PR does. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Well, yeah, definitely check that out. And where's the best people? Well, best place where people can connect with you, Jeremy? So they can check me out over at commandyourbrand.com if they're interested in the book. Um, it's over at getextraordinarybook.com. Um, it's taken all the conversations I've had over the last few years and taken all that knowledge and put it into actual, like, real doable things that you can really function from people that have done it, like not go stare at a mirror five times and tell yourself you're awesome. This is real world use from some of the best performers out there. So it's getextraordinarybook.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on, Jeremy. I appreciate you. We'll have you back hopefully sooner than five years next time. But thanks for sharing your wisdom. I really appreciate you. Absolutely. And, and, and I appreciate you having the forum you have where I can feel like I can just kind of 
bear it all in a way that I have not on other shows before. So thank you for, for uh, having me on, man. My pleasure. It's always just an open, authentic conversation here. So thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.